Hi, and welcome back to the wonderful world of the scientific hypothesis. My name is Brad Alger, and in this video, I want to explore a little bit more the idea that we evaluate hypotheses by subjecting them to tests that we think might make them fail rather than those that we expect them to pass. This incorporates the notion of falsification. And as you remember, this means that our scientific facts are really hypotheses that have passed the tests that we've put them to, but not been proven false. They're true as far as we know. Now, some people find this reasoning so counterintuitive that they question the whole notion and value of falsification. Here, we'll try to clear up a few common misconceptions about the process and see if we can't make sense of it for you. So let's look into this idea of falsification. First, we'll consider a couple of misconceptions about it, and then we'll look at a common sense application of the principle of falsification to see if that might help strengthen your intuition about it. We'll review the two kinds of knowledge that you gain by falsification. And finally, we'll look in a little bit more detail into this concept of tested and not falsified. Let's look at a quick review of the scientific process that we've been talking about, the one we attribute to Karl Popper. First, we're going to propose a hypothesis that we think is true to explain some phenomenon or observation that we made. We'll then test the hypothesis severely to see if it might be false. And this means, of course, we'll look at the predictions that the hypothesis makes and we'll make measurements to see whether they're true or false. If the measurements don't succeed in falsifying the hypothesis, then we consider we have a hypothesis that we still think is true and that's a true explanation for the phenomenon or observation. All scientific facts then are these tested and not yet falsified hypotheses. And this of course means that no scientific fact is 100% certainly indubitably true. They're all hypotheses in one way or another. So here are a few of the many misconceptions that you may encounter about falsification. Falsification only leaves you with rejected hypotheses. It's a good way of finding out what is untrue, not what is true. The purpose is to find incorrect hypotheses. Now, all of these sorts of ideas and others like them either represent complete misunderstandings of the principle of falsification or are deliberate attempts to make it seem nonsensical. Here's an example that might help clear up some of the confusion. Suppose we want to create a product, say the perfect tire for the family car. We develop prototype tires, things we think may work, and we then test them severely, running them over rocks and glass in horrible weather during rain and snow and under terrible road conditions, trying to see what will make the tires fail. We reject the failures and try to build on the successes. Obviously, if we want to know if they're truly reliable, it would make no sense to test them only in perfect weather on smooth, flat, well-paved roads where we expect them to perform flawlessly. Now, it's true that, indeed, the severe testing does produce piles of ruined tires, but that is not the purpose of the testing. And piles of ruined tires are not the main product of the testing. Gaining knowledge is the purpose of the testing, and the knowledge gain is the main product. It's the same with hypotheses. We test them severely to find out whether or not they're really reliable, not to confirm our comfortable opinions that they'll do well in certain conditions. And the purpose of the testing is not to destroy hypotheses, but to gain knowledge about what works and what doesn't work so that we can improve our understanding of nature. So here then is our big scientific machine. It's taking in many, many different kinds of hypotheses, testing them severely and sorting them into bins labeled false or not false. Now this side, the not false one, we've already discussed. What science knows is our collection of tested and not falsified hypotheses. This is one very valuable sort of information we get out of it. We haven't mentioned, however, that it is equally important and informative to get a collection of falsified hypotheses. These are also source of information because they represent negative data. We now know what doesn't work. 
We'll come back in a later video and discuss negative data in a little bit more detail, but this is the second kind of information we get by testing hypotheses with the principle of falsification. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes on this concept of tested and not falsified. Admittedly, it's a very awkward formulation, and Popper knew that, and he suggested that we use the word corroborated in its place. It's important to realize that corroboration is not the same as confirmation. Confirmation implies something about the future, what we think will be true in the future, and this is the fallacy of inductive reasoning. The fact is that we do not know for sure what will happen in the future, and it is unrealistic to think or imply that we do. Corroboration, on the other hand, is about what we know from the past. What experience has shown is not false so far. Corroboration, in other words, is about what we've learned from past experience. It does not presume or promise anything about the future. It simply affirms what we found to be true up till now. We may believe it will be true in the future, but we must keep our beliefs separate from our knowledge. Now, you might ask, what happens when a hypothesis passes a severe test? Well, strictly speaking, the hypothesis is corroborated by that test, and corroboration only applies to the tests that were passed. Corroboration does not confer general validity on the hypothesis, and it's not a guarantee that the hypothesis will pass other tests. Now, these are the severe logical standards that we're obliged to live by, but they do not include or rule out the understandable psychological factors of confidence we might feel in a hypothesis that passes other tests and so on, and we'll come back to those issues in later videos. There's one more question we can ask before leaving this issue. If a hypothesis passes a test, is it more likely to be true than it was before the test? Now, many people, including scientists, tend to get this wrong. It goes against the grain. We really want to believe that we're approaching the truth as we find and test a hypothesis. But if you think about it logically, the answer has to be no. We can't say that we're closer to the truth unless we already know what the truth is, and we don't. After all, that's why we're proposing and testing hypotheses. Science is not like the little kid's game of blindfold, where the audience sits around calling out warmer and cooler as she gets closer to or farther away from the object she's trying to find. There's no one out there to help us out. And the history of science is rife with examples of hypotheses that have lasted for many years before ultimately being found to be false. A good example is Newton's laws of mechanics, which stood for several hundred years and were repeatedly corroborated until the early part of the 20th century when the quantum mechanical revolution and Einstein's theories of relativity showed that they were inadequate and had to be rejected. It is nevertheless reasonable and rational to act on the basis of the best information available and hypotheses that have been corroborated by passing severe tests represent our very best current information. Thanks for watching. Remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to hear more. See you next time.